Good morning. I'm Mehdi Sanaji and welcome to OETV. We're joined with Jeffrey Huge, founder at Alpha Insights. Hey, Jeff, welcome back. Great to be here, Mehdi. So lots been going on. And first of all, yeah, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and you're watching more soccer than American football because it's the season. You know, I am. That's it. And we've got two big games today. So, uh, you know, USA, UK, England, you know, we're representing both sides of the coin here. So, you know, two wins across the board. Come on. Um, you did publish your piece on Friday night. And obviously we had the, the shortened week from Thanksgiving. Bit of green there. But obviously you've been highlighting about the market being overbought. Um, we did see a sell off yesterday. But let's run through your, your piece and, and start with the top down. Talk us through sure. Well, you know, uh, let's put it this way. The market is up some 16% uh, off of its lows in October. We are running into what I would define as a difficult level. Uh, that level is a major downtrend uh, line that uh, began off of the January highs and connects the March and the August highs. Uh, that also happens to coincide with the 200-day moving average. And, you know, our analysis suggests that this is a counter trend advance based on the form and character of the advance, which has been a very choppy, overlapping um, uh, waveform. And from that, we can discern that, you know, we are very likely near, uh, if not already past uh, the peak of what we would define as intermediate wave two of primary wave three down. If we're correct in that analysis, then we should quickly take out the 3906 level and the November 4th lows uh, to confirm that primary wave three down is in fact accelerating to the downside. So, you know, our concern at this point is that uh, many people are holding out for, you know, the year end Santa Claus rally. And I think we already had it. I think it's behind us and it tends to come early and earlier every year. So, um, we've been advising our clients to continue to hold uh, maximum cash reserves here uh, into year end and minimize net equity exposure uh, in advance of what we expect to be a significant decline into um, uh, the first quarter of next year, which we think should bottom around S&P 500 2250. 2250. Um, Jeff, can we talk about the yield curve, please? You know, if you could run us through your thoughts here and how the curve is steepening and a shift from short-term to longer-term Treasury yields. Yes, well, uh, we titled this uh, slide Trouble with the Curve. And, um, you know, the reason for this is, um, as many people have pointed out, we're, we're not quite steepening yet. Uh, we actually are looking at the deepest inversion since 1980. Uh, between twos and tens, and that's the lower frame, lower panel of this chart. And that inversion um, has many people concerned about uh, a 2023 recession. As you know, we've been talking about kind of a rolling recession. We think we've maybe been in something of a rolling recession for some time now. Fourth quarter GDP looks like it's, it's trending for its best quarter of the year. And uh, that kind of throws a bit of a monkey wrench in the in the recession call for many people. Um, but, you know, we think it takes a good six, nine, 12 months for these rate hikes to fully um, uh, rationalize in the real economy, right? And so um, as we start to kind of pass those, those mile markers, um, we think that the impact of, you know, nearly 400 basis points and soon to be 450 basis points of, of Fed tightening coupled with a, um, a quantitative tightening approach to uh, balance sheet drain. Um, we think all of this is start, going to start to have a real impact on the economy in 2023. And it's likely that the yield curve will begin to steepen ahead of that, uh, as has been the case in every uh, uh, past recession for the past 40 years, uh, the recession occurs during the steepening of the yield curve, not during the inversion. The inversion is the warning that it is coming, but eventually we think um, this, this yield curve, curve must steepen at some point. And because the Fed is still, you know, according to the so-called dot plot, on track to raise rates by at least another 100 basis points next year and possibly more, 
Um, we think it's more likely that the 10 year bond yield goes higher uh, and that the steepening occurs at the long end of the curve, not by the short end of the curve uh, contracting. And so that's kind of the thesis here. And uh, we think that's the highest probability outcome. Yeah, can we have a look at the 10 year? Um, the 10 year treasuries yields have been neg shown a negative correlation to the S&P 500. Do you yeah, think but, this is going to reset at some point? Uh, I, I think that this negative correlation has is, is been uh, in effect for the last year. It tends to be the case. Um, you know, the whole um, mantra of the 60-40 portfolio is that stocks and bonds are inversely correlated, right? Um, what's been the case is that bond prices have been positively correlated with uh, treasuries for this year. And so I do think we're going to go back to the old regime at some point. Uh, but what I think is most likely at this juncture is that uh, bond yields will uh, continue to remain negatively correlated to treasuries uh, for the short term. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, both seem to be running into what I would define, again, as a difficult level. Uh, treasury yields have pulled back to, uh, you know, kind of an interim support level. And just below that, what I would define as kind of major key chart support, uh, which coincides with trend support uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, if we look at the S&P, which is in the lower frame of this panel, again, we're rallying right into a difficult level, right into trend resistance. And it appears to me that that has rejected price uh, based on yesterday's price action. And so, you know, I think there's a high probability that we're going to see uh, yields move higher and prices of stocks move precipitously lower over the next several weeks and months. Thank you for clarifying that, Jeff. I got myself a little bit tangled up in the uh, Treasury yield conversation. Um, let's have a look at uh, consensus CPS, because you've been talking about this for several months, how these numbers have to come down, and it now looks like they are doing so. Indeed, in, in quite a uh, material fashion. You know, according to S&P Capital IQ, uh, which is our source for consensus uh, EPS estimates, we have seen uh, growth collapse in the current year from 10.3% at the outset of the year to now just 5.1%. Uh, EPS growth. For next year, it's even worse. Worse. Uh, we were looking at 10.1% um, at the outset of this year. That has now collapsed down to 3.5%. Uh, that is the consensus outlook for earnings growth next year. That puts consensus earnings at about 221 right now for 2022. And for 2023, we're now at 231. That's down from 253 at the beginning of the third quarter, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of the third quarter. And so, you know, just over the last, say, two months, we've seen, a, we've seen a material collapse in earnings estimates. And the reason for that is there's been uh, what I would describe as some common sense adjustments made to operating margin estimates. And as we can see in this chart, uh, which was published by the uh, Yardini Research, uh, that, you know, basically the consensus has lowered their out year operating margin forecast from 14% just three months ago down to 12.7%. Uh, that takes a lot out of the earnings equation, about $20. And frankly, we think that um, this is probably going to still prove to be much too high when the rubber actually meets the road. We actually think operating margins, which, you know, are Profit margins are the most mean reverting series in finance. I mean, we've all heard uh, that over and over. And um, frankly, I think if we look back at the very long-term mean for profit margins, we're looking at like 9.3%. 12.7 uh, is still you know, some distance from the mean. And I think we're going to converge on that mean much sooner than most people believe. So uh, that's our view. Um, Jeff, this is you, this week. You discussed some of the tech layoffs that have been happening. We've been seeing all the headlines across the board. There's a, there's a lot that have happened. There's more that are kind of being indicated. You think there's a lot more to come? I do. Um, you know, this is just tech layoffs, and um, you know, there's a, a firm called uh, Layoffs.fyi uh, who publishes this data, and it's based on publicly available information. They source everything. 
And what we've seen is about 861 tech companies have laid off over 138,000 employees uh, since January 1st of this year. Now, um, the interesting thing is that Meta, Amazon, and Uber combined represent 20% of that total. And so it's the big giant tech companies that are really having the most significant impact on this. And the question is, who's going to be next? Um, from what we've been reading, it looks like Alphabet could join the party very soon with another 10,000 layoffs before the end of this year. And, and frankly, I think um, employment is kind of the big issue that is being ignored in the whole uh, debate over the recession. I think when you start laying off you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of high paying tech jobs, I think that is going to have an impact. And uh, it's already starting to have an impact in Silicon Valley. Understood. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate, but it kind of all makes sense. Um, Jeff, this is a very interesting chart. You've removed um, price from the conversation and you're purely focusing on trend. Talk us through this because I haven't seen this before. Yeah, you know, uh, we get asked the question all the time, you know, how do we know this is a bear market rally? How do we know that we're even in a bear market? And I said, you know, it's trend that really defines this. And we can come up with all sorts of different definitions. You know, TVs come up with this idea that, you know, down 20% is a bear market, up 20% is a bull market. I mean, nonsense, right? But, um, you know, the reality is uh, bulls and bear markets are defined by trends, you know, longer term persistent trends. And so what we did is we we looked at daily price, closing price changes and we created what's known as a moving average ribbon. ribbon. And so what we've done is we put 25 moving averages from 10 day to 250 day. And what we've done is we then turned price invisible. We eliminated price from the diagram. And the moving averages are all you see. So all you can see is trend here. And it makes it much, much more clear what's actually going on in the price. And you can see the very short term uh, moving averages are quite noisy. And what tends to be the case is when we do get into consolidation phases, they tend to become entangled. But then when the trend begins to, uh, again, reassert itself, they become uh, more of a, uh, they're more in alignment, okay? And so the further out you look in that 10 day to 250 day, the more aligned the, um, the moving averages become. And, and the reason for that is because it's defining the long-term trend, the durable trend. That trend has quite a bit of inertia and it's gonna take an enormous amount of entanglement amongst those moving averages to, um, create uh, what's necessary to reverse that trend. And we can see how it occurred over time as we went from you know, a persistent uptrend into what is now a persistent downtrend. And what I'm seeing right now is some of the very short-term moving averages have become entangled again, but they become entangled at a very low level uh, in terms of where uh, the trend is. And so there's there's significant work that needs to be done before we can have any sort of um, confidence that there's a reversal in place here. And so by this, we believe that, you know, really only the smooth flow of moving averages uh, in alignment uh, can, can really indicate the direction of trend. And in this case, a durable trend. And we think that trend remains down. Jeff, yeah, from trend, let's have a look at price. Um, let's roll into our technicals here, starting with the primary degree Elliott wave count. Yes. Um, so, you know, of course, we've talked about our longer term thesis at nauseum, and uh, we wanted to really drill down into the shorter term options in the market. So primary degree really measures uh, the advance off of the 2020 low. And so we look at that uh, move from March of 2020 into the January highs, as, as really being primary wave five of cycle wave five, uh, the prior advance, right? And so from that high in January, we have two really good options of what's really unfolding here. And, and really um, corrections unfold in two manners. They unfold as a, a three wave uh, that begins with five waves. So five waves down is wave A, three waves up is wave B, and then five waves down is wave C. Um, another way that it can happen is that um, 
you have a more elongated uh, five wave decline. And that more elongated five wave decline is the primary wave decline. And so, you know, we are counting that down as our preferred count as uh, primary wave one being the June low, primary wave two being the August high, and that everything that's happened since then is a subdivision of primary wave three down. Um, so the first decline into the October lows was intermediate wave one, primary wave three. And the counter trend advance into the November 25th high last Friday is in our opinion, intermediate wave two of primary wave three down. Now, once the market trades down below the November lows, and, and really we've kind of highlighted 3906, a breach below 3906 will break the trend line and chart support, small minor chart support of this counter trend advance. And that would give us a lot of confidence that um, intermediate wave three of primary wave three down is in full force. And so um, that's what we're focused on right now. Alternatively, if we're wrong about that, then the alt is simply this, that the initial decline into the June lows is probably an A wave. It's probably primary wave A and that we're in the midst of primary wave B at this point. And so if prices push materially above the 200 day moving average, uh, when I mean materially, I mean sustainably, they don't come back below it. Um, then I think there's a high probability that you know, the price is going to push somewhat higher to say around 43.65 which is the 61% retracement of the decline off the January highs into the June lows. That would constitute primary wave B. And from that B wave high, we would expect wave C down to carry the market into the 2400, 2500 range. Uh, we've actually counted it to 2440 as an exact target. And that's based on a 1.618% um, decline vis-a-vis -vis the wave one decline. So wave wave C rather would be 1.618 times wave A. And that's a very common wave relationship. So that's our alternate count. We think there's a lower probability that that plays out. We're giving that about a 30% probability. We think the preferred count has about a 70% probability at this point. Jeff, can you bring things into the shorter term for us? Absolutely. So um, focusing on the preferred count, there's a couple of options here. And option number one is our favored option. Um, we believe that, um, you know, the market topped on November 23rd, November 25th. We got a little, little bit of a double top there. Uh, we think that the rollover that we saw yesterday is the initial phase of decline that will carry the market down below the kind of key support level that we put in place at 3906. Uh, which would also uh, take out the uh, uh, ascending trend line off the October uh, and November lows. And so uh, we're really focused on that level. And once we break below that level, it will confirm that option one's in play and also that um, uh, intermediate wave three of primary wave three down is, is in full force. Now, option two would suggest that we don't break that level and that we scoot a little bit higher. And there is some room for additional advance here. Uh, we've counted the uh, counter trend advance as a double zigzag, W, X, Y. And so um, one of the um, common wave relationships that exists is that wave Y would be equal to wave W. And that would occur at 4118. So there's that possibility. There's also the 78.6% retracement, which is the square root of the 618 uh, retracement. And that comes into play at 41.47 or so. So, you know, we've put out this kind of stretch range, 41.18 uh, to 41.47 as being a possibility if the market moves above those um, February 23rd, February 25th highs. Uh, at this point, we are leaning strongly in favor of option one here, uh, which strongly supports our preferred uh, uh, Elliott wave count. Right. And how about uh, market internals? How have they evolved over the last week? Yeah, you know, they continue to suggest that um, this rally is occurring at a lower degree of trend. And the reason that we think that is because 
you know, it, it's been a relatively weak rally from an internal perspective. You know, uh, if we look at the June August counter trend advance using the NYSE index, that saw a 14% gain. But the counter trend advance off the October low so far has exceeded that. Um, it's actually up more than 17%. Yet, if we look at the internals, okay, if we look at breadth, if we look at uh, momentum, if we look at volume, all of those things are showing up as being weaker than they were doing it during the June August advance. And so, and that's in the NYSE. If we look at the NASDAQ, which is on the right hand side of the chart, they're miserable, okay? Uh, the NASDAQ's gain has been about half of what it was in June, August. So it's been exceptionally weak and the internals have been even weaker. Uh, with the exception of um, net advancing volume, uh, everything is just basically bouncing around their, their recent lows. Uh, and um, net advancing volume has not made a new high. And so that is as weak as, as we've seen it. And uh, you know our, our view of net advancing volume in the NASDAQ is simply that we still think that there's a lot of speculation. And we think that strength in net advancing volume in the NASDAQ is indicative of that. So you know, I think the, the moral of the story here is that we've got a relatively weak internal rally uh, underway and the rally uh, is, is definitely weaker from an internal perspective uh, than it was back in the June, August uh, uh, advance. And so that suggests to us that this is a, a counter trend advance and a lower degree of trend than we saw back in, uh, in June, August. And where does uh, investor sentiment sit with all of this? Well, yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, if we look at all the surveys, the major surveys, whether they be, um, you know, uh, investors intelligence, uh, the American Association of Individual Investors, uh, ICI data, uh, looking at uh, the name exposure index, all these surveys suggest that, you know, um, investor sentiment is something around one and a half standard deviations below its mean looking back over the last 25 years. But if we look at investor positioning uh, as it relates to equity allocations and also as it relates to um, margin debt, and if we could take the slide back, um, that would uh, suggest that investors have yet to um, you know, significantly liquidate those, those positions. In fact, uh, margin debt, uh, you know, while the rate of change has continued to uh, decline, uh, it continues to be much higher than it has been at uh, prior lows. And also, um, in fact, if we take a look at levels, we're still at you know, significantly high uh, margin debt levels relative to historical peaks. And so um, you know, our view is at this point, um, investors have a lot of work to do in terms of liquidating or delevering their portfolios and liquidating their equity allocations as compared to history. And so we just haven't seen the extremes in terms of uh, positioning being liquidated relative to the so-called bearish sentiment that's been out there relative to the past 25 years of history. I think that this suggests that there's a lot more in the liquidation phase left ahead of us. Scary stuff. Um, if it all pans through, that's going to be a that's going to be a very worrying move, which is, I guess, exactly what you're calling for. Um, Jeff, obviously, some movement in some of the, the stocks we've seen last week. Um, any sectors of note that you want to highlight for us? Yeah, this is my favorite chart this week, and and in fact, the reason for that is, well, normally we look at last week's leadership. We're actually looking at the leadership off the October twelfth close through the November 25th close. So if we just simply use that, uh, October 12th was the closing price low for the S&P 500. So um, if we take a look at the advance from that closing price low, if this was a bull market, we would expect um, discretionary to be at the forefront of that advance, to be the leader. In fact, discretionary is the worst performing sector. Uh, you know, it, it is actually up only two and a half percent, roughly. Uh, whereas, you know, if we take a look at materials or industrials, which are up close to 20 percent, um, that is not what one would expect if, in fact, this was a new uh, bull market advance. And, and another thing that I would point out is that 
financials and utilities, which tend to uh, perform best in um, bear markets, in, in the late cycle uh, of the economy, in the early cycle of a bear market, we tend to see financials and utilities as some of the better performers. And exactly what we would expect is occurring if this is a bear market. And so financials and utilities, while not the very best performers, have been uh, significant performers, certainly in the top 40%. Uh, you know, they have been uh, basically number three and number four out of 11 and, and strongly outperforming the S&P 500. And so um, that leadership by financials and utilities and that lagging performance by discretionary suggests to us that this is not a new bull market advance that's emerging. In fact, it is a counter trend advance that is in the early stage still of a bear market, which suggests to me that, you know, the economy still has time and work to do before the recession kicks in, uh, as evidenced by what we're seeing in the yield curve. And, um, you know, the market is continuing to track its historical bear market playbook. And so um, I think this is just further supporting evidence uh, that we have to take seriously um, that suggests that this is a bear market rally that's probably terminated or very, very near so. So, Jeff, that leads me, as usual, how, how do we make money other than betting on England today? What do we do? <laughs> well, you know, we have been focused more on kind of the traditional defensive sectors, uh, healthcare, staples, utilities, um, to a lesser extent. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I think that we can look at, you know, um, materials and industrials. They seem to be performing very, very well right now. Uh, but, you know, I really like healthcare. There's still growth in healthcare, and healthcare is leading. It's in the, you know, top uh, quintile of leadership. And so, um, you know, we've, we've chosen a company called American, Amerisource Bergen. It's a drug distributor. Uh, the stock made a new all time record high last week, uh, has broken out on a weekly closing basis to a new weekly closing high. Uh, from, you know, what I would describe as kind of a, a traditional nine-month base formation. Uh, it is remains in an uptrend. So if we look at, uh, you know, weekly closing prices, uh, this stock is still in its uptrend. And so that base formation is uh, what we believe to be the early stages of a, a breakout and a new run uh, going forward. And so, <clears throat> you know, given the strong relative strength character, a breakout above 165 gives us the ability to count a measured move to 196. Um, now, if we set our stop loss at uh, 159, uh, that would give us a better than three to one positive risk skew here. So uh, we like ABC, Amerisource Bergen. And what about anything on the short side? I'm sure you've got plenty to pick for, uh, for that. We do. And uh, if you notice the prior chart, we had indicated really kind of the big five tech stocks as being our, um, you know, um, favored bear case setups. I mean, all of them look terrible, but the one to us that stands out is Google. Uh, Google looks like it's about ready to careen lower. Um, you know, the breakdown below 96, um, you know, or uh, below 105, rather, stock went out at 96 last night, but the breakdown below 105 gives us the ability to count a uh, measured move down to $60. Now, what we're looking at here is a stock that's broken its uptrend, it's broken chart support. There is a clear, you know, two-year uh, classic pattern top formation of the inverted cup and handle variety. The stock's made kind of its initial foray down to 85 and has rallied back into resistance, into trend resistance. We think this is an opportune time to sell the stock before it makes its next move lower to $60. Uh, we would set our stop loss at 105, setting up a four-to-one positive risk you we like the short side of Alphabet. It's a very scary looking chart there to end on. But uh, Jeff, as always, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights. Always a pleasure. We'll see you next week. And uh, good luck to you in the US and good luck to England uh, playing Wales today. So uh, thank you for watching and good luck investing.